Okay. I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> and then let me start sharing. All right. And hopefully, let me get rid of that. I don't think I need that anymore. Okay. Can you all see that? Can I get a thumbs up maybe? Or well, you're all have pictures. Out. Can, can somebody tell me? If I can, can see it. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so I did this little, I like to do with my classes, I like to do, and a couple of you have been in, in my class, I like to do like a lecture portion, and then um, we go into the demo. And so I want to talk to you guys about what I think about when I'm, I'm doing um, glass. Um, basically, these four things, and I like, and those of you who have studied with me before know that I like to kind of keep things short, so that you can remember them. I don't, you know, I, I find it not helpful to be able uh, to be working on um, I mean, to, to be thinking about several concepts of, at the same time, it's just easier to like think of no more than three, maybe four, I have four here. Um, but when working with about working with glass, I'm thinking about the silhouette and I'm very intentional with the words I'm choosing. I'm saying silhouette here and not contour, because I think when we think contour, sometimes we think hard edges or a certain gestural kind of mark, whereas silhouette is more ambiguous. And um, I think it allows for more kind of open form and losing your edges. And that's definitely what you're doing with glass, right? Um, glass is such a fun thing to paint. Um, so sublime, you're basically painting nothing, right? Because <laughs> it's transparent, um, you know, unless it's holding something. And if it's water, you're still kind of painting nothing. So you're painting mood a lot of times um, and, uh, you know, when you think in terms of silhouette and you think of you know hard and lost um hard and um and soft edges and lost and found edges i think that the the term silhouette applies to that much much better then the next thing i think about is contrast and what i mean by contrast is a condensed value string where you're literally just thinking about your light your dark and your um your light your dark and your midtone and that's it literally three things you're not thinking of like a ton of nuances it's that contrast that really um that really speaks glass so anytime you're working on glass and it's not exactly coming through you know up that contrast and uh, that's usually a good way of resolving that uh and then we have the specular highlight which um all of you are familiar with you know any any uh, glassy type of um object you know will receive the light and will it'll bounce off at exactly um at ex exactly the angle that it's receiving the light uh so that's that gives us a lot of information about where the light source is coming from you know it can be the pattern of you know the shape of the light like for instance like a window like in the uh the dutch paintings which we'll see in a little bit um so that's that's something you're going to pay attention to and with the specular highlight you have basically you have two things so you have um you have the actual light source, which we talk about this in, in my other classes. So some of you have heard this, but you have the color of the light source. So if it's a if it's you know um, a fluorescent light, you have that that you know that cool bluish light, and then you have what's what's referred to as like a cushion around that highlight, and that's the local color of the object itself. So that'll be more informed by the color of the object. So look for that. You'll have that bright 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 color, um, and then right outside of that, you'll have you know more subdued color but um i should say the first the first highlight is the higher value and then outside of that in the cushion you have more color but less value it's more subdued uh and then distortion and so there's a couple of different things you're thinking about with distortion you're thinking about you know the light coming through um the glass and you know how the glass is formed and you'll see distortion there you'll also see refraction so that's the phenomena that we have right with light um, where if it's hitting water, it'll basically break off like like a stem. You'll see that often where, you know, it's cut in half. Um, so paying attention to things like that, those are fun things to paint and to allude to in, in your painting. So these are the four things. So we'll talk about this as we go through. I have some uh, some painting selected to talk about. So silhouette, contrast, specular highlight and distortion. All right. So and I definitely would love um, you guys to jump in here as well. So feel free to unmute yourself whenever you want to. Um, so I wanted to look and see how long we've been painting glass, like as people, right? And I found this really, really cool mural from Hercul uh, Herculaneum, Italy, which is outside of, it's actually in the uh, Bay of Naples, so near Pompeii. And this is 62 to 69 CE, which is um, known as the Common Era. So it's the alternative to like, uh, to AD, like BC and AD. Um, so this is right after Christ, right? 
um, 62 to 69. And look how beautiful these um, paintings are, right? And they're frescoes. Uh, and, you know, so you could clearly see that, you know, they were already thinking about these concepts of, you know, um, uh, of silhouette, you know, contrast, specular highlight, like we have that, you know, right here. Um, and then distortion, you know, you have you have a little bit of that as well. So I think this is just fascinating. I didn't look, I wanted to see if there was anything like in Egyptian, like how far back I could go, but lost time. I'll, I'll, I'll do that thread and I might follow up with you guys. So um, I'm pulling up the painting and I'm in some of these, I'm gonna have a bigger one so that we can see it a little bit more fully. So this is what I mean, you know, by silhouette is clearly shape, right? And then contrast, this is very simple, right? We have basically just like, you know, the light areas that are acting as like highlight. And then you have your dark areas, which are acting as a shadow. And then, you know, a possibly a mid-tone kind of area in here. And that's it. It's three things. That's all you really have to think about. So it's really like, you're kind of just sketching a shape and letting areas go. Um, and then, you know, looking to see what's happening with the distortion of, of the light and the refraction. So um, this is kind of a fun one uh, to look at. Okay, so moving on. So this is another, and we're gonna go chronologically in history. This is George Flegel, he's German. Um, he's actually, this was more new to me, but he's pretty prolific. There's a lot of his paintings out there and you know he was active um, there in the, um, the 1600s. And um, this is kind of an interesting, um, in Spain they have these wine, uh, pictures, um, I, call, I think they're called bodegones, and I think that that's kind of the style of what that is, where it's like this kind of fluted, like this just weird shape that we're, you know, almost Dr. Seuss, right, like in terms of its weird shape, but that's what it is. It's a water vessel, or uh, in Spain they use them for wine, and, and you know, they're pouring them out um, that way, but again, we have the same exact elements, right? We just have silhouettes, so we have what is the shape of, of this object, and then we have plenty of lost and found edges, you totally are losing so much of this to the darkness. Um, and that's what gives it that feeling of the transparency. And, um, you know, we have our specular highlights. And then clearly here you have evidence of like uh, windows, which is so evocative of, um, you know, of the of the Dutch um, Flemish, the Northern school, like you'll see that a lot in their in their paintings. Um, and then you have, you know, the highlights on the cherries as well that coincide with the highlight on the um, the specular highlights on the glass, you know, obviously you always want that to match up so that it's, you know, realistic. Uh, so it's happening in, in the same, uh, the same uh, uh, atmosphere. Um, so this is pretty, this one's pretty straightforward. Um, let's move on to this one. This one is gorgeous. I don't know how many of you guys have seen this. This is actually at the National Gallery of Art. So when the pandemic's all over, <laughs> maybe this is something you might want to go see in person if you haven't seen already. And uh, this is definitely, this is Dutch. So this is, you know, the Dutch still life, the, the a momento mori, you know, that, that whole thing about the life death cycle, which the Dutch were kind of obsessed about because they were Calvinists. And so like everything had a religious theme to it. And, um, and you definitely see that here, although this is more, you know, this is more evidence of, you know, some of some of these flowers are kind of beginning to, to decay, which is, you know, the life cycle. And you'll see, you'll see a lot of things like that. Like that's like what, what the um, insects are referring to is the, the, the decay of life. Um, and, uh, but then look at that beautiful, that beautiful vase and I'll, I'll pull it up in another, um, the next slide. Um, but uh, it's, it's barely, you know, all the emphasis is on the flowers, which it should be. And you'll see that in a lot of painters, you know, going forward. Um, one in particular that comes to mind is Michael Klein. Uh, he's, I've studied with him and when he does his paintings, you know, it's, it's all about the flower, uh, you know, so there's definitely this hierarchy and the glass is there really just as a supporting thing to the flowers. So it's like, it's just barely there. It's like this presence, um, like a subtle presence, but it, it really makes the painting itself. Um, Right, so here let's pull this up so we can kind of see it a little bit bigger. So you can see that it's mostly just green um, tones, like mid tones and, and some dark values that also um, mirror the values here in the background of the painting, which is an important thing because if it's, it's when we have these values that are so close together that we lose edges. So that's what's making this look atmospheric is that, is that the values are very close together. Um, so we're losing those areas and then they're being very selective about, you know, about their specular highlight. Again, we have that beautiful window, which you can even see um, the panes in, in the glass. 
which which is interesting about glass. Um, my husband and I, before we bought this house where we're now in Luckett's, uh, Virginia, we had a house in um, downtown Leesburg, and it was a historic house. It was 100 years old, and it had original leaded pane glass um, in the house, and it was really fascinating to see, like, to learn about the history because, you know, originally when they started making glass, they could only make them a certain size, and then with time and with more money, they made larger and larger glasses. And so the size of the glass, depending on the time, the air of the building um, is almost like um, speaking about how much money you had at the time. So it's, 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 it's really interesting to see, you know, how many panes of glass and how large they are. Um, it's kind of like a statement. Um, so in putting that, in putting this into the painting, I mean, the, the Dutch were just, they, they were very aware that they were making these kind of statements. They, you know, they were Calvinists, so they definitely had this kind of spiritual side to them, but they were also middle class. A lot of these paintings were made for um, the merchant class that was just beginning and they were really flourishing and they wanted to show off how much money they had. So I find this stuff just really super cool. All right, and now uh, we're gonna go a little bit more. We're gonna jump a um, couple centuries and here, we have Stuart James Park, he's Scottish. Um, really some lovely uh, little paintings of his, um, not highly well known, but uh, just very simple. And I love this painting because of just how simple the pansies are. It's just these beautiful shapes, um, not very complicated, not a whole lot of you know value or description there, but look at that beautiful glass. And uh, we'll go here to the, to the next one. Um, it's a little uh, pixelated because the, the resolution on this picture isn't, um, isn't so so good, but it, it's the same exact idea. So you guys can can see, right? I think um, you know about just kind of letting the glass go and letting the glass become part of the atmosphere of the background, and that's what just you know makes it feel like glass. You're just losing it. So so here on these, you know, there's a hard crisp edge, and the crisp edges are usually, I mean like 99.9% .9 of the time where there's areas of contrast. So you have your dark here and then you have your light and that's what automatically makes like a hard edge. And then you have here where these areas are, are more similar, that's where you can lose an edge. And so, you know, here's the soft areas as well. And then there's the, just the inference of green here where he, he you know, he laid down some greens into those grays and then he painted his stems into that. And a lot of painters will work like that. You'll see Michael Klein working like that as well. And then you have your specular highlight. And um, this is kind of an interesting thing. If you guys set up um, your own flowers to work from and you're working from, um, from lights, like we all are, right? Like the majority of us don't have beautiful windows behind us. I certainly don't in my studio. And um, then you have this conundrum about like how much of that specular highlight to paint. Cause sometimes it's not like a really pretty shape. Um, so I, you know, will try to simplify it as much as possible. And I'll oftentimes will just do something like this where I'll just, you know, put, put a generic kind of shape um, and, you know, soften that out um, instead of like making an exact replica of what I'm seeing there. You know, you're the artist. So, you know, use your artistic license, pull that out and, you know, edit it, make it look prettier because a lot of times these like, you know, hard lamps, um, they just, they're just not very attractive. Um, so think in terms of, of those things. All right, this one's cool. Vincent Van Gogh, who doesn't love Van Gogh? Um, I thought this one was a really neat painting because actually I, I had seen it before, but um, it, it's been a while. So it was really fun to kind of dive into. Um, and this is just a glass of water. So you can, you can tell that it's a glass of water that's fluted, right? Um, so you're definitely getting that feeling in terms of the pattern here, um, but you're getting this cool, the refraction. So here you have the stem and then it's it's broken off, you know, subtly, not super, you know, sometimes you'll see it and it's a little bit more, you know, the refraction is really, really far apart and you probably don't want to exactly paint it that way. You want to paint it more like this. So um, I don't know how much of this is artistic license, but, you know, he's seeing the, refra the refraction, but he's also just subtly suggesting it. And I think in terms of painting, the more you can suggest, the better off you are. Um, in terms of, you know, getting something beautiful. Because oftentimes I think we get ourselves in trouble when we're perfectly trying to delineate everything and, and put a box around things. You know, sometimes you just can't describe form as so easily. Um, so yeah, I super, really, really love uh, love this one. Um, and then, you know, of course, you know, the the background is, def is obviously going to be affecting, you know, your object of your glass. So clearly here you have, you know, the, the book that's coming through the top of, of the glass. And then, you know, it's darkened because it's passing through that glass. 
Um, so, you know, it, it separates this is more part of the foreground and, and this is more part of the, the background, but just super, super lovely. You guys feel free to jump in anytime you have any questions or, or comments. I'm happy to have them. All right, so this is one of my favorite painters, Uanuglo. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with him. He is a British painter and he is like, he's the bomb diggity for contemporary painters right now. Everybody is absolutely in love with him. And he just recently passed away in 2000. Um, I did not become aware of him until a couple of years ago. And it, it's really interesting. His work in particular really influenced an entire generation of painters, especially in England. And that's, I'm getting really inspired by a lot of the British painters right now. And um, he's definitely one of them. Um, I wrote out, let me see, I, I had a little note here. Let me see if I printed it. Um, about about Uwen, um, Uglo that, you know, he worked, he worked exclusively from observation, which is really kind of interesting because his work is just so modern looking that you might be tempted to think that he wasn't, but he was definitely, was all about observation and he would just paint over and over again you know, if he didn't like it, he would scrape it out and just paint on top of that. And his his technique is known for a couple of things. It's known for these little tiny, which I don't think you can really see. He was he was really yeah, you can see here. There's a little tick mark where he's lining up something, and that becomes part of his his work. That's kind of his signature. You'll see the way that he constructed his his paintings. He doesn't hide things, so he has these little tiny tick marks of measurements to see where things align, and he allows that to to show through. And the work here, it's more subtle. You'll see it more in other pieces. And maybe if we have time, I'll pull up um, something else. But he's also known for these uh, geometric um, shapes, um, which it, it's just a really interesting contrast to, to be working spots of color in a geometric uh, way when you have kind of a rounded form like this. So that automatically kind of starts giving it like more of this contemporary feel to it. And you can see what he's doing here with, with the light that's coming through here um, in the water and how that how bright that is that value versus you know the other values of the stem and then of course you have again the distortion you know so this is like fatter here at the bottom and then we you know we're totally losing um, you know he's allowing the glass to be totally lost here and to just you know blend with the um, the background which is just so lovely so it really has just a beautiful um, just a beautiful presence to it it's, it's just so it's subtle but it it you know it's just it's really really lovely. So um, Ewan definitely influenced other painters. This is a guy named Jason Line and I picked him, I wanted to put in some more kind of contemporary painters to see what they were working with and just look at how lovely this glass is. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just barely there. It's like a whisper of a glass and I just absolutely love that. So he has like this shape and he's just totally let go of all of these, you know, of, of this hard delineated silhouette. Um, and you know he just didn't need a whole lot, and it's just really lovely how you know the background of the um, you know of the background of the table you know comes through in 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 the uh, in the glass, and it's just lifted here in the corners, which indicates that it's a it's a curved you know um, form, right? That it's a a convex form as a, as opposed to a concave form. Just really really lovely and subtle. And again, you have the distortion here, and again it's subtle, right? We can't be too obvious with things. So you know um, here it's it's it extends a little bit out, it's a little fatter, right? Um, so the entire, you know, there's nuance here, even like, even though this is like a solid shape, there's, you know, there's some, you know, in and weaving in and out of form uh, where it narrows and then it thickens and, you know, that adds areas of interest. You wanna make, um, if you wanna make a painting boring, you make it all look the same. You make all your edges look the same, you make all your, your silhouettes look the same, you just treat it the same and you're gonna get something stylized. And um, that might be what some people, you know, some people might like something super, super stylized, but in good painting, that's just, it's it's not good painting. You want variety, variety is the name of the game. And he's definitely giving that to us here, but very subtly, and that's, that's where the art is. Beautiful form on this daffodil. Um, my next class, actually, um, to mention that, put in a little plug here, my next class is next month and it's daffodils and we're, we're gonna be painting daffodils from my garden. And I've planted a whole ton of varieties, a lot of different shades. We'll be working also with temperature and um, because they're daffodils, it'll be subtle, these subtle kind of uh, relationships, which, you know, um, it's just beautiful uh, what we see here. Uh, we're gonna be working similar kind of ideas. Um, 
Okay, so then here is an artist, an Israeli artist named Dana Zaltzman. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she's definitely coming out of that atelier, um, that atelier background. I think she even studied at um, uh, at the Florence Academy. I think she was one of their um, one of their graduates. But this is just such a lovely glass. I mean, it has um, you know such a lovely presence. I'll, I'll pull it up here a little bit further so we can see what's going on here. And again, you know. Just subtlety is the name of the game, right? And we were, you know, she's allowing um, areas to just totally just um, slough off, you know, off the edges. Like that's, you know, when, when we're looking at an object, you know, as it gets further away from us, so as the curve gets further away and gets more severe, that's when we, we're no longer seeing it in our in our view. And that's when when it drops off. And so it's, it's these kind of areas where you can just let go of that edge and allow it to incorporate into the background and just subtly do that. And then she has this beautiful, you know, specular highlight here where this is the area of the higher, um, this is what I was talking about earlier. So, so that is the color of the light source, right? That's the exact color of the light source. And this is the cushion, the rest of the reflection, and that's the color of the object itself. So it's, it's, this is the area where you're, you're going to see the color, and this is the area where you're going to see the most intense value is in that highlight. Um, so look for things like that. And they get just beautiful, I mean, very soft treatment of edges, but there's also, you know, so this, I would say, in general, she, she has kind of a soft touch, but there are areas where there's hard edges. And again, it's the areas of contrast. So there's the light and the dark, and that's where you're going to find your hardest edge. And then the areas where it's, it's, more, it's more similar in value, that's where it's going to be. A, it's a nice opportunity for to lose an edge there. So she has the variety in there that, that we're seeking. Okay, Jeffrey Larson. How many of you guys are familiar with him? He's fabulous. Um, and he, so he's, um, there's a, uh, um, there's, there was a, a movement, a pre-atelier movement. There was a, a gentleman by the name of Richard Lack, and I think he was working in Minnesota, and Richard Lack created his own atelier before the ateliers started. In fact, a lot of the artists that went on to create their own atelier studied with Richard Lack. And he has a direct connection to artists that studied in Europe who did study in the French Academy. So that's kind of um, people that are into ateliers, like they're really big on their pedigree. And um, and he, this guy, Jeffrey T. Larson, studied with Richard Lack at his atelier in Minnesota. And you know, so he comes from that direct lineage of the French academies, and it's a big deal in their circles. But anyway, he's he's kind of, you know, so he has that feel of the intense realism that the ateliers bring, but he's doing a totally different thing. He's much more, oh, hold on, I'm letting, I gotta let one more person in. Okay, one moment. Okay, MK, I hope you're, you're joining us. Um, so, uh, so Jeffrey Larson is, you know, so he's part of that whole atelier. Um, he's part of that whole atelier movement, but he's really approaching it in a very different way. And he's doing that with, with beautiful temperature shifts and that's his hallmark. So if you look at his work, like they're all these beautiful neutrals, but they're so subtle. Um, I totally love, there was uh, one painting I did of a copper pot that I think is still on my website, totally influenced by him. Like just all the subtlety of of these beautiful temperature values. So you have this, you know, gorgeous, you know, yellows and, you know, these purplish reds and, but they're just so subtle. And, you know, when you squint your eyes, it, it reads all as gray and that's, you know, that's what he's doing, but he's, you know, when you open your eyes again, there's just, there is the color there. It's just, you know, very, very subtle. And the way he's doing um, the glass. So again, we have here, we have, you know, the five components that we talked about, you know, you have again, your silhouette and he's losing the edges here in the areas again that are similar, the most similar. So that's where he's losing his edge here. Um, here it's a harder edge. So anywhere where we have the contrast, like again there, that's where you're gonna have your harder edge. And then this beautiful specular highlight, look at that, right? That's just gorgeous. Um, so, so beautiful. Um, you know, and, and how he incorporated, like you definitely have that high intense value in the center and then the couche is just subtle and it's just around it. It's these beautiful lavenders and grays as it goes around and, you know, stops right there on that fish. And so it really adds, adds to that form building. You know, you really feel the presence of those fish like that. Just so, so lovely. Um, love this one. All right, oops, went a little ahead of myself. Okay, so Michael Klein. So Michael Klein, again, coming out of this atelier 
system. Michael Klein, actually, I'm pretty sure he studied with Richard Lack. So again, he has that same pedigree. He studied with Richard Lack that Jeffrey Larson, the previous artist, also studied with. Um, so they both started there. And then Michael Klein left there and went to New York City. And he studied um, at the Grand Central Atelier with, um, oh my goodness, I'm totally uh, blanking on his name right now, but the founder of it. And um, so he's also coming from um, the French you know, atelier system. Uh, and he's obviously very influenced by Fantin Latour. Um, that was one of his heroes. And he talks about that, although he bristles a little bit because he wants to be considered you know, very different than, <laughs> like he wants to be considered doing his own thing, which I think he is. He's more like his shapes are much more abstracted when you really get up close to them. Um, but I picked this one because you know, he does just beautiful you know, glass and the glass is definitely secondary to, you know, to the flowers themselves. The presence, the drama is all in the flowers and in, you know, a certain grouping of flowers. So you have like this beautiful pairing of all of these ladies, right? All together. And they just create one entire shape here of light. Um, and then you have, you know, these, you know, this counterbalance here of these shapes of these flowers. So it's a really nice, um, it's just a really nice balance. And then you have these other flowers that you know come off. He's very deliberate about his um, his arrangements. So, ladies, when you're when you're working on yours, definitely spend the time. I mean, this man, I've seen him. He'll he'll work on an arrangement for thirty or forty minutes, and then go have a cup of coffee and come back, and you know, then start painting. So he definitely is really really um, thinking about absolutely every single element of his work. And uh, you know, and then we have this is the phantom thing. You know, you know, a single blossom outside of the vase. And you know, so so you know, you, you're just you're you're just cut up in this beautiful painting. So you have these these ladies here all together. They're they're the highlight, right? They're kind of the superstars. And then from there, you know, you go around and then back down here. So your eye is just constantly trapped in this painting. And as painters, that's what we want to do. We just want to. We don't want the person to leave. You know, we want their eye to be you know, just fascinated and constantly finding details to kind of fall in love with. And this painting definitely delivers in that area. Um, and then we, you know, the glass is the same kind of thing. So you have, so I've seen him paint. So what he's doing here, let me, let me pull up here. Here's a, here's a, here's a detail. What he's doing with here is he will just, at, when he's first laying this in is he'll just scumble in, you know, like the local color of what the, he thinks that green is. And he'll just erratically scumble in. And that's why, you know, he's thinks of himself as more, um, he definitely starts with a more abstract approach. And so he's, you know, scumbling it in and then he'll put in uh, things to delineate um, edges. He'll, you know, uh, to delineate forms. He'll, he'll, he's really uh, big about putting in reds. And he says that the reds, so you can see here, like this transparent red oxide or this burnt sienna. I think he uses burnt sienna. The, um, guys, my dog really needs to be, <laughs> you just hold one second. I'm sorry. He's, he's, um, he's a little ill. So hold on one second. I'll be right back. Sorry about that, guys. So I have a Great Dane, and um, he's a whole lot of dog, and he has a very sensitive stomach. And lately, he's been decorating my basement. I don't know how else to put it. <laughs> so when he's calling and he needs to go outside, I have to kind of let him out. So that's that's what that that's about. It, you know, literally looked like a crime scene here, like just this morning. So um, anyway, you know, back to the subject. Back to beauty. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, he's really, he really pushes you to make sure that you have your reds to set off your greens, because this is, this is a, a, you know, this is a masterful tip that you cannot have greens without the compliment. Um, it's just one of those things. It's like, you know, you really, um, you know, you, you know, I always talk in religious terms, I guess, like, you know, uh, my upbringing, but you can't, you really can't have good without evil. Like you kind of need the balance, right? Like if everybody was the same, you wouldn't know a good person, right? So, you know, you need the reds to set off the greens. And so he's very intentional about having these warm reds um, that set off the coolness of these greens. Um, and, and yet you have areas where, you know, the values are so similar. So the value here is similar to the value of the background that, you know, he has opportunities to lose those edges. And so that's what he's doing here. And he's doing the same thing with the specular highlight that we talked about where you're doing, 
you know, the highest value there and it's it's it starts to dissolve into the couche, the local color of the glass itself. And that's we, that's where those lavenders are coming from. Also influenced by the, the flowers around it, but that is the color of the glass, that gray color there. Um, so I think we're coming up to the last last two guys. So this is Dwayne uh, Kaiser, who a lot of you guys are familiar with. I've studied with him as, as well. I took a workshop with him and he was phenomenal. So if you guys ever have the opportunity, definitely um, study with him. Um, I just love this piece, um, just so direct, you know, in your face. And again, it's, it's all the things we talk about, the silhouettes, you know, the, the lost edges. And this one, you know, definitely has more subtlety of value um, and colors than any of the other ones that we've looked at. In general, I think you can get away with just, you know, your light, your dark, and your mid-tone. Here, he's definitely gone and he's, you know, separating some of these mid-tones a little bit more to, to have like a cool and a warm area. Um, and, and that's principally because of the focus, right? Because it's in your face and you can see all that detail. You wouldn't be able to really see that from far away. Like in a lot of the paintings that we were set, seeing earlier where, you know, there's a still life on a table, you're looking, you know, uh, from more of a distance, you might not be able to see all these subtle kind of uh, variations, but he definitely, you know, allows it to show through in here. And here's a clear um, case of the distortion that we talked about, right? And the refraction. So to look for all those things when you're, you're painting um, and to put them in there, you know, um, uh, and, you know, you can be subtle about it, but obviously this isn't as subtle. This is interesting, right? So you have, you have the distortion of the pair here and then, um, and then you have like a pair, butt. I don't know how else to, <laughs> to say it here, uh, sticking out in the corner, um, but just a really interesting uh, composition. And then uh, here's another Dwayne Kaiser. So um, this definitely inspired my choice for today for my demo. Uh, I just love his little orbs and, and how he always seems to, to manage to stick himself into, into the orb. It becomes like a really cool way of doing, um, you know, a, a self-portrait. And, you know, again, I just love this window, right? I mean, he must have the most gorgeous studio, this beautiful like north lit window, which is, again like a reference to the dutch still life that we saw you know with the other things earlier um just so beautiful and so he's delineated some of the panels in here but he's not fussy about it he's not delineating absolutely everything you know he's indicating some things and he's just letting it go and so i think that's the name of the game with the subtlety and then you have this distortion obviously right you have the bend of the table you know and and the way that it goes around the room you have the beautiful rafters kind of going up here I have that in my studio, although my studio is not as nice. <laughs> it's an unfinished room, but I have um, some of the rafters as well. And the paraphernalia, you know, just really, really, really lovely. And then this is obviously his canvas. So it's, it's you know, really tongue in cheek. Like this is the um, uh, breaking the fourth dimension, right? I think is, is what they talk about. So um, just so, so subtle to see that. I mean, so it's just, it's beautiful. All right, so that's basically um, my talk about, um, and I'm gonna, uh, for, for MK who um, came in a little bit later, I'm going to just go up real quick. So MK, we talked about, um, which we'll go over, but just to kind of keep in mind, we talked about four things that you need to consider in painting and that's silhouette, contrast, specular highlight and distortion. And I was very specific about these things, which you'll hear in, in the recording as to why I chose those particular words. But those are the things that I'm thinking about when I'm painting glass um, and when I'm looking at paintings, um, definitely. So so that's what we um, we covered in terms of the in terms of the of the art. Let me just flip up real quick to my um, my last slide, because I feel like um, before we go into the demo, I um, so as a teacher, I feel really very much like I'm part teacher, part cheerleader, part art coach. <laughs> like it's very, very important to me that people kind of get the right idea about painting and that they don't get turned off. I've been to workshops before where um, people feel like totally um, out of their element. I mean, obviously, you're you know, anytime we push ourselves to learn something, you know. You know, we have to kind of enter the temple of learning like on our knees, right? Like we have to, you know, lower the ego and just be ready to work and learn because otherwise you can't absorb anything new. And I've, I've been to workshops and seen people like just feel so overwhelmed that they start crying and literally leave the workshop, you know, and that's always made an impression on me. And I never, ever want my um, students to feel like that. So I, I always try to kind of like do a little pep talk kind of thing. And um, 
So I'll close out my, my lecture component here with, with just the ways that I think about painting. Um, I, I have these, you know, kind of uh, metaphysical kind of thoughts, you know, that I, I have little sayings that I have all over my studio and they very much inspire me. And, and one way that I think about painting is, I don't know how many of you guys are sailors, um, but this is an analogy that I think about all the time. My brother sails and he actually did not pick up sailing until he moved to San Francisco. Now he's back, thankfully. But, uh, you know, big uh, sailing town there. And when you're, a, when you're sailing, you pick your destination, but it's not exact. It's never precise. Like you, you know where you're going, but the entire time you have to be making small, um, you have to be what's called tacking. You have to make small little adjustments left or to the right you know, to keep you on track, to keep you towards your goal. And um, that's, you know, that's a, uh, that's something I think about with painting, because, you know, we have this intention in mind, you know, we have this, you know, where we want to go with our painting, but clearly the, oftentimes the painting itself is going to be fighting us, right, while we're working on it. And so you constantly have to be making these little tiny adjustments left and, and right uh, to get to your goal. And so, you know, think about it like that. Think about it as being, uh, I don't know how much of you, how many of you are doing yoga, but yoga um, has brought a lot to me. You know, I view everything now as practice, um, which is fabulous. I mean, what a concept, right? That we just don't have to be so hard on ourselves, and it just allows more discovery. Um, so, you know, just view everything in life as practice, and uh, I just think you'll get further. You know, you won't be beating yourself in the head because that's an easy thing to do. There's so many people out there that will tell you that you're doing things the wrong way, or you have to do it this way, or you know, even the ateliers, like from what I understand, if you, if you haven't gone to an atelier, they, they don't think you're well-trained, you know? So it's just kind of crazy. Um, these these uh, labels people will put on things, you know, and that's not true. There are a million ways to do things. You know, it, it oftentimes it's just in what order that you put something that, you know, will get you that result. And, uh, but you can, uh, you can approach things from so many angles and I uh, just want everybody to, um, you know, to be thoughtful of that. So um, here's our little, uh, well, I'll end this lecture. I do have another kind of humorous um, analogy to that. So this is the other thing that I think about. <laughs> this is Lego Batman. <laughs> um, how many of you guys have seen uh, Lego Batman? Anybody out there? I'm gonna totally raise my hand because I have a 14 year old. This, is, this came out when he was a child. But um, this is another way that I think of, um, so this scene I'll, I'll, I'll give you, uh, it, it's very quick. But um, Lego Batman is here with, um, you know, with the, with the secondary character. I can't even remember his name. I think it's like Space Buddy or something. And they're trying to break into this like evil guy's, you know, headquarters. And all he has to do is hit a red button with his bat batathong, you know, or the the bat like, uh, you know, <laughs> um, the bat. Uh, what's that? Oh my God! I'm totally blanking out. You know the, uh, um, uh, you know. Anyway, with with his bat thing. And, um, and he just can't do it. Like he's just, you know, going, so I'll, I'll play because it's, it's pretty obvious. So that's it. So paintings like that, right? Like, oops. Okay. Paintings like that. It's, you know, we never ever nail it the first time around. So again, it's just, it goes back to that thing about just being gentle with yourself and giving yourself that, you know, uh, that room to grow. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, and even like when people are doing things like, you know, especially we all know this, right? With social media, you can make things look like it's perfect, you know, the first time around, it's not perfect the first time around. And even if it is perfect it, the first time around, that particular artist probably practiced that exact thing for like 10 years. And that's why it's just beautiful and effortless. So. Um, I think it's important to kind of just keep those things in mind. So before I go into the demo, does anybody have any questions? No? Okay. All right. Well, then we will proceed. So um, I, um, before I go into this, I'll just say that I, I, I demoed, I taped this ahead of time. Um, for my shorter workshops, I usually demo live, but I had um, my vaccine, my second shot uh, yesterday, and I wasn't quite sure like what kind of effect it was going to have on me because I have heard um, it, apparently it has to do with like your blood type. I'm a B positive, so apparently people that have A and B blood types um, are having worse side effects to the vaccine, and it's, it's also correlated with people that, um, it's the same exact effect with, with COVID actually, so people that have A and B 
uh, blood types tend to have more of a reaction. But people that have O's don't have any reaction whatsoever to the vaccine or to the to COVID usually. Um, so, you know, I'm a B positive. So I was like, oh no, this, this might not work out well. So I definitely, you know, I filmed it ahead of time, um, but I'm fine. No, no side effects, everything's good. So let's get that started. Okay. All right, I'm gonna try the. All right, you guys can still see this, I would imagine. If at any time it cuts out, you let me know. But so here, um, you know, I have my reference and uh, I'm working on that Arches oil paper. I really love that for, uh, for little sketches and, you know, even for some more sustained still lifes, I've been doing that as well. And so here, the first thing I'm just trying to scumble in you know, my background. And I will say the video is definitely darker than what I was seeing, uh, you know, than, than the original, what I was seeing here in my studio. Um, but, you know, it'll work for this. <laughs> it'll make more sense as we get further in. Um, so, you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, oftentimes I will start with the background um, for two reasons. One, I, I feel like I mentally need to kind of like um, ease my way into something. It's kind of like getting into a pool and not just diving in, like kind of, you know, gently getting into the, the shallow end, you know, to, to accommodate yourself to the, um, acclimate yourself to the temperature. I, I do that. So I'll often start with my background. And the other purpose of that is that then it allows me to have my, my boundaries, my edges wet so that I can manipulate them when I do my actual object itself. So the order that I'm doing this is, is I think important um, in that it's just a, it's a more forgiving order and it makes sure that you handle all of those um, little, little subtleties that are like, you know, um, when I first started painting, I've talked about this before, I, you know, I went to an art school that was not particularly known for realism. And so, you know, they didn't really talk about edges and things like that and how to activate edges. And to know that you have to really be considering all that stuff from the very beginning, from the get-go, you got to be thinking, you got to know where your soft edges are, where your hard edges are, and keep that in mind as you're painting. Um, that was kind of a, a newer concept that I learned later on studying with art, other artists. But in the beginning, a lot of my, my work definitely looked, you know, like all the edges were similar, like more stylized, you know, and that's the reason. Um, so you have to be intentional. You have to, you know, build up. Uh, in the right way. And so here I'm, you know, laying in the foreground and that's the shadow underneath that, uh, you know, object underneath the glass. Putting in this value here. This is, uh, this color was an interesting color. So the, the color on my palette um, that I have for, you know, the generic color that I have for a lot of these um, classes is phthalo. Um, but it was really closer to more of a turquoise, um, uh, which I have. So I, I, I did have also turquoise on my, on my palette that I started using more for the ball itself, you know, for the reflection, because it's definitely, you know, brighter in value there in the center. So you're putting in, you know, so again, just kind of sneaking up on it, right? Just doing the background and, um, working into it. You guys feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions as need be. All right, so now now I've set up you know the background. So I've set up the stage, and now we're gonna now the um, cue the entrance of the leading lady, right? So that's the object itself. That's that's the emphasis of this painting, and I usually start with my darks. That's usually the first kind of you know the low hanging fruit. <laughs> it's kind of the easier thing to pick and find. So I'm putting in, you know, and, and I'm just drawing here. And since I'm scumbling, I'm basically trying to cover the paper you know, as much as possible. And the paper has an interesting texture to itself, which you can use, you know, um, 
if I wasn't painting so directly, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's an interesting surface to paint indirectly, like more of a dry brush where you're kind of building um, on top of that. Cause you can, you know, this graininess, you can allow that to, to show through and be more um, subtle and thoughtful about it. So just putting in my darks where I see them. And if there's a delay, it's because I'm mixing color. I tried editing a lot of that out, but then I found that I was editing too much. So <laughs> we'll have to sit through that. Guys, I'm going to let the dog back in. I will be right back. <laughs> Keep watching. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> what did I miss? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so I think I was adjusting the temperature there in that one area of that wall. It's definitely warmer. The ball itself is a golden kind of ball normally, but there's so much reflection and refraction happening. Well, refresh, re reflection, because there's no water here. Um, and I find it helpful when you're painting to, you have to squint. This is the thing that nobody tells you. They tell you to squint, but they don't tell you to squint at your painting and at your subject at the same time when you're painting. I never heard that. <laughs> when I finally put that together, whoa, does that make a difference? So that's, that's what you're doing when you're doing that. You have to squint at both. So um, what, I'm, what I did there was I laid in that local color, more the aggregate of that shadow in between the rafters and then I'm going to be laying the color, the lighter color on top of that. So intentional about, you know, your chest moves, right? Like, you know, what's, what goes, what goes back, what goes more forward. And here just um, drawing that in. Oftentimes I'll try to be more subtle with the value at first, and then I'll put the brighter color on top of that. So I'll, I'll paint with a more subtle um, underdrawing. So that's what I'm here. I'm doing here. I'm probably mixing up a brighter color. <laughs> All right, just suggesting that middle area, um, just kind of a mid-tone. All these things, you know, it seems slow, but all these things, you know, very quickly, once you, you lay this out, you're basically mapping all of your forms and you're mapping all your values. And once you lay that in there, then you can kind of pull those little pieces all together, pull the strings together. And you want to get your um, your brightest brights, your lightest lights in from the very beginning. So I'm building up towards that here, but I won't like leave a painting session without having indication of my my brightest value and my darkest value. So there, finally, there's more of a CAD going in there. Starting to use smaller brushes. I try to use the bigger brushes as much as possible in the beginning. It, it keeps me honest. It keeps me from getting too fussy because I can definitely paint the heck out of any detail. 
I'm trying not to. <laughs> That's a bad habit to get into. When drawing uh, lines, oftentimes we're thinking about like the edge of our brush, um, but it's also helpful to just kind of chisel that shape in to make that line to go boom, 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 as opposed to just delineating a line. Sometimes you'll just get a nicer line doing that. So you'll see me do that in a couple areas. I'll point it out when I do it again, but I, I find that really helpful. Again, dialing up on that value there. So here I'm going into the table. It's definitely going to be a lighter value. This is, um, I had this uploaded to YouTube, so it'll be up there. I'll, I'll send you guys all the links. You can watch it again whenever you want to. And YouTube, um, for all of you who do videos, uh, when you upload to that, it's not very forgiving when you fast forward through things. <laughs> so that's why I'm not fast forwarding to the areas that I did not edit out completely, because I'll never get it back. <laughs> so we'll just kind of wait. <laughs> So um, when I'm laying down color, I'm thinking about, you know, what is my local color? How light or dark is it? I'm thinking about temperature. That's very helpful. More than what the color is specifically is how light or dark is it? And then, you know, what is the temperature? Is it warm? Is it cool? And I think if you ask yourself those questions, it's, you, it's easier to get after what, you're, what, you're, what you want than to, you know, get tied up on the name of things. Anytime you're painting, names, you're kind of in trouble in painting anyway. You need to be um, thinking shapes, thinking really broad categories. It's interesting because the video is definitely a little bit bluer than what the painting is. The painting's a little bit more, um, the value's different and the, uh, it's also zoom. I don't know how many of you have noticed that, but zoom definitely changes the colors of things. And while I'm painting, um, again, going back to that practice of just being gentle with yourself, like you're, so when you're painting, you are basically putting the exact value in the exact temperature in the exact spot. That's what painting is, right? And like our bit Batman video, we often are not gonna nail it that first time. So, you know, you're going, you're kind of, you know, throwing your little arrows at it and, you know, you're hoping to land in the center, but if you don't land in the center, you know, you tack towards it like in the sailboat. So that's where all of my weird analogies are coming back. Um, so you're just dialing in and you're concentrating more and more on that area. So here I'm doing, you know, the, the reflection there of that um, cap, the golden cap on the, uh, under, under the ball. And so as I add in these darker values and I get all my values in there, that's when it really starts to become more three-dimensional. And again, I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking, um, you know, what's what's behind, what's in front. So I'll usually paint the value of what's behind first, and then I can lay another color on top of that. This was fun to paint because it had a lot of really interesting colors. Like you can see, it has like this 
purplish lavender that I'm, I'm doing now. Rosy colors. Um, then you have all that fun, like just that really cool, uh, this area here, it's just this really cool turquoise, what's happening on that gold. It's just really, love it. <laughs> so feel free to paint from the reference um, if you want to do it or set up your own. How you um, put paint on is important too. You can, you know, um, your paintbrush is bas basically an extension of your hand, right? So with time, you'll get that tactile sense. You'll, you'll know how to put a layer of wet paint down and then put another layer of paint on top of that without having the two mix, unless you want them to. So it's, it's kind of knowing when to, like when you're um, changing when you're turning form, right, which is what we're doing with 2D into 3D objects, um, how much of that can you accomplish with the way you're painting, like how you're layering the paint on top of it to get to that effect, or how much of it is, you know, nailing that specific value? Because there's, you can do both. You can approach it both ways. You probably should. So here I was doing that little dab, dab, dab thing to make my, my line. It's a little fat there, but So now because I'm getting in that extra val value there, that darker value, now it's beginning to look more round. And I'm correcting my drawing as I go along. I'm making it more round. And I'm trying to add in those values that I see, like there's some turquoise um, happening up here, as well as this red color, which is, you know, uh, basically the rafters in my room. So now I'm going with my tinier brush as, as need be, my little edge there. This is a neat little brush. It's actually a comber, but it's tiny. Um, let me see if I can grab it real quick. Uh, lately, I've been painting with a lot of like kind of cheap brushes. <laughs> this is called a Filbert Grainer, and it's by it's it's a Princeton brush. Um, this is a, a, a wider one, but that's what I was using. I was using their, their tiniest one. I think it's like an inch. I mean, one is the setting. I mean, one is the number. Um, but, uh, you know, I have a collection of brushes and um, they range from rosemary brushes, which are, you know, those fabulous brushes that are made in England. Um, I have an issue ordering them because my, uh, my credit card always thinks it's fraudulent anytime I'm ordering anything from, uh, from abroad. <laughs> so it felt like they'll freeze my card. So um, I usually only buy the rosemary brushes in person at uh, conferences, or now you can get them uh, in the United States. There's, um, there's different vendors. Um, uh, there's one called Studio Pintura, I think. And um, I just bought a whole bunch of them, uh, rosemary brushes through them. So that was great. But in general, I'm uh, lately, I'm kind of really craving, I'm really liking the cheap, cheap bristle brushes that you get from like Michael's, you know, super cheap. Um, you know, bristle that I can just beat up. And because I'm, I'm in my studio work, I'm painting more uh, with a dry brush technique. And I just love that because I can get a lot of paint on there and, and lay it down. So um, it's nice to have that variety of, of brushes. And you can definitely do some great painting with the, uh, you know, with those cheap brushes. And then you can throw them away if you don't feel like cleaning them. <laughs> which I don't ever do, never. <laughs> so here's just refinement of my edges here, of my shapes.
Um, I also try to, if I can get it accomplished, the first pass, you know, that's a term used in, in painting, right? You have first pass, which is the alla prima, right? When you're doing it all at once. Um, I try to get as close to my, my finishes as possible with that very first approach. And, um, but then, you know, I'll go in with second session or third session as need be. And I will approach that entire way as an alla prima session as well. Just try to get, you know, whatever I'm working on, try to get it into as high of a finish as I want in that first session. And just to approach each session like that. Instead of just leaving things for like another occasion, I find you rarely, you know, you rarely hit your mark when you do that. You really have to address it when you're working on it. So here I'm laying in that reflection of that light on that golden cap. And then, um, you know, starting to put some of those gold tones down. Definitely did not do a whole lot of detail here. I kind of kept things more geometric, kind of approached it more like Uanuglo, right, with these geometric shapes. You could definitely get lost doing a lot of detail, but then you got to ask yourself, do you need that? You know, is that what you're painting? And that's kind of where I'm at right now is, um, you know, I want, I've always been somebody that's been attracted to technical ability in painting, but that's not the end all be all of painting, right? Like there's ex expression. So I think about that a lot lately. Like, you know, what is the purpose of fully rendering a detail? You know, are you just kind of showing off that you can do it? Um, that kind of thing. So I'm thinking a little bit more broad in terms of my approaches. And each time I lay down a color, it's an opportunity for me to correct the drawing. And to get closer, dialing in on that shape, on that value, that hue. So now I'm happy enough with that shape. And I think I'm gonna turn that form a little bit from that bottom edge of that cap. Yeah, to that little rim there. And these um, tertiary colors, you know, so you have your primary colors, your, you know, red, blue, and yellow, and then your secondary colors are the colors made from that. And then your tertiary colors are the colors made from that. And so that's what a lot of this is. That's what a lot of your grays are, are those tertiary. They're kind of your in-between colors. But those are the colors that hold everything up. You need all of that neutral to hold up the color. So I'm going back here. There's that dab, dab, dab. There was a time with my students that I couldn't say dab. <laughs> There was a time when I, I was painting, um, I mean, I, t I taught kids for a very long time in my studio. Um, and I'm really glad that I don't have to do that anymore. Um, they were wonderful kids, but they were, they were always uh, touching my things and kind of breaking things ac accidentally. But one thing that they used to do when I would say dab is they immediately do that, you know, that thing. <laughs> so I laugh now, even when I say dab, but it's, that's what it is. It's a dab. All right, I know I don't get too detailed on this. I think I'm going for that golden color and that shadow, yep. And then, you know, so you put it down, you're like, okay, that's not quite the right intensity. That's not quite the right value, not quite the right shape. And so, you know, first try, <laughs> you can go back in, adjust. Oh, see, I edited something out there, sorry. So I'm laying in my highlight there and I'm being, you know, considerate as to how my edges of that highlight look. Adding in kind of those darker values within it.
delineating shapes further. There's a little shape of me in there that I did not do when I was doing the demo that I do want to add to it. Just a little tiny something just to say that I was there. <laughs> so I will do that. All right, now I guess I'm doing, yeah, the ring on that, on the ornament. And I laid down the color and I said, okay, this is not quite the right value. And that's that little tiny brush I told you all about. It's a number one Princeton Comer. So that's, I'm just laying in the, um, the hanger there. I mean, the hook, just subtle. Don't want that to be like a hard, too hard of a shape that would keep your eye there. You, you want, like I was thinking about having the eye kind of come into the, the shape of the object itself. The highlight is more the center of the ornament. shadow. Again, just subtle, just a little statement. I think about painting a lot like that as far as, you know, statements, how loud statements are, how soft they are. That's my screen behind that. I have a screen that I paint from when I'm painting from a reference. And then I also have an area in my studio where I paint from just a still life setup. But normally when I'm teaching my classes, I do uh, take the reference and I send it to my students because I want us to be all painting from the same thing so that we're talking, you know, apples to apples and not apples to oranges. So here just addressing the edges. I think we're getting pretty close to the end here. softening some of those divisions of light and shadow. You know, as you're, um, you know, uh, this area here right underneath the ball, that's called your inclusion shadow. And that's a term meaning that that's your darkest part of the shadow. It's, it's the shadow that's right below the object itself. And then in general, your shadow will like soften, right? As it's getting, oops, did I stop it? Yeah. It'll, this is what I told you about YouTube. <laughs> It's very sensitive. Um, it'll it'll soften as it gets further away from the object. So you do want to delineate that, depict that. So just some final touch up there to the to the drawing. I think I went with the tiny brush because honestly, I just had it loaded with that color. The shape is more exaggerated. Oh, that's it. Okay. Let's get out of that. Okay, so wait, where is my picture. One second, I had it open. Okay. 
Okay, so that's that's where I ended. So um, before I end this share, I wanted to see how many of you guys um, are interested. Here, let me pull this down so I can see all of you. I had one person selected. Okay, there we are. All right, so uh, I'm gonna be offering the demo like to you guys, to the participants. So uh, if you don't wanna be part of it, please let me know, I will not be hurt. But um, I've gone ahead and I have uh, put all your names in and then I'll mail it to you. I, um, I put all your names in this name picker. Okay, these are all the participants that were registered for the workshop. And of course, you know, if you weren't here, you're still el eligible. So you ready? Do, 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 do. <laughs> See who's who's the who's the name? Who's the lucky winner? Um, Hina, I think I hope that's how you pronounce your name. I hope it's like Tina. Um, you're the winner. So congratulations. I will be mailing uh, this to you. So. Um, thank you for par participating. I'm going to stop my share so I can see you guys can see me and um, I can see you all. <laughs> Thanks, MK. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions? That was so amazing. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you guys joining me today. Um, hopefully you learned something new. Oh my gosh, yeah. And there were so many cool artists that I had never heard of and their work is just Mind blowing. Fantastic, right? I, I'll yeah. I'll follow up with all of you guys. You know, you'll get you'll get my presentation of my lecture and 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 the video, the Zoom video, and also um, the the regular video is on YouTube. So I'll give you the link for that as well. And I will give you the list of all those artists, so you have them as well, um, so you can follow them or or what have you. But yes, yeah, so many really good artists. I mean, glass. This is something that's been you know, painted so many times and so well. So we have, you know, a wonderful record of how to do that. Um, you know, the best practices in terms of painting glass. So hopefully you guys, you know, learn something. I thoroughly enjoyed having you guys in, the, in my class. Um, uh, again, another plug, my next one is, uh, my, next, my next class is in March and that's a four week class. And with the four week classes that's set up a little differently, it's in the evening and I teach for an hour at a time. And then I hope that you guys also do homework um, um, several of you have been in the class, so you know the way that that goes. But then, you know, then we critique a little bit at the at the end of each class going forward, and you know, just build a piece that in a similar way. So, you know, we're working from a reference that we're working together, and like each of my videos, I break down the steps for that week of what your homework assignment is. So, um, I hope that this is kind of you know giving you a little taste for the class, and I so appreciate you know you you guys all the love and um, the support. Uh, I'm, I haven't checked the chat, so let me check that real quick. Oh, thank you, MK. <laughs> That's great. All right, well, if you guys um, don't have anything else, I can, um, you know, put the meeting to a close for, for today, but, you know, I'm totally here for questions, so feel free to ask anything. Awesome. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with me on your lunch and your busy days. I really, really appreciate it. I always enjoy it. I look forward to signing up for another one soon. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. All right. Have Take a care. good evening. I hope you continue to feel well post shot. Thank you. So, yeah. So far, yeah. so good. Like I'm really, really amazed. I, I really did not expect to, I thought I'd be, you know, in bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so awesome. I'm very, very glad to be, you know, on the other side of that. And I hope you all go get your shots soon too, when you're eligible for them. So. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. I'll be in touch soon. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.